uh, I appreciate the sounding board to be able to discuss the the gold market this afternoon, and in particular investor trends. I'm uh, responsible for the precious metals uh, distribution effort here at, at UBS. Precious metals is very much uh, part of the DNA of the firm, and, and as, as a, a brief overview of, of the business, we're a full service uh, precious metals business. We have uh, touch points across the whole uh, value chain of, of the industry, ranging from producers, uh, refiners, and investors, and end users. We're divided into four key areas, namely custody and clearing. Uh, we own and operate a major vaulting facility in Zurich, uh, and that holds gold on behalf of central banks, pension funds, and, and other commercial uh, institutions. We offer a physical service, so we, we pick up the metal from refineries, predominantly in Switzerland, uh, shipping it to the key physical markets uh, around the world, China in particular. And uh, uh, one of our most important markets is our home turf, of course, in Switzerland, providing small bars and coins to the retail community. Uh, and the two other parts of the business being physical, we, we are um, a financing rather, we are a bank. Uh, so we, we help finance the working capital needs uh, of our end clients. And uh, what most of you will relate to would, would be trading. Uh, so we're providing the liquidity services to, to, to customers uh, in, in all the trading products. So uh, this afternoon, my objective is to pro provide a flavor of, from the coalface, uh, if you like, as to, as to what type of trends we have seen during this unparamounted time in our marketplace, uh, focusing on client flows, positioning, and, and how we, we view investor participation into 2021. I'll just summarize gold market drivers. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the top macro driver behind the gold price and how in turn the rise of allocations into gold since the advent of the pandemic and how we feel the potential is for further uh, long only allocations. Uh, secondly, we'll, we'll focus on how COVID has dislocated the marketplace and how it has shifted the dynamics of price discovery and liquidity among market participants. And finally, on that subject, on the market participants, we'll touch on the evolution of the actors involved in, in the market and how investment trends have evolved uh, so far this year. So in, into the, the first main slide, uh, if I may, uh, beginning with the gold market drivers, um, whilst the action has been fairly range-bound over the last uh, month to, to six weeks, uh, the consensus remains towards uh, higher prices. I figure that the reasons to, to own gold no longer requires much of an introduction. Only one needs to, to plot the aggregate balance sheet of the Fed, ECB, and the Bank of Japan against the gold prices depicted in the first chart. And that leads us to the conclusion that the central bank stimulus has benefited gold in the past, and it will continue to do so from here. Uh, with the opportunity cost of holding gold is no longer an issue, especially as real rates have tended towards a negative territory. The narrative has attracted significant inflows. I would say that despite the recent bounce in the dollar, gold has held well, and in fact, it's been quite resilient in the sell-off in equities. And it broadly appears that gold's performance as of late reflects the type of interest that the market has seen this year. Broadly, allocation tight demand, and to some extent, especially at, these, at the price point that we're seeing right now, weaker longs that are now out of the marketplace and who have exited their positions above 2,000. As a proxy, in the bottom left-hand corner, We've analyzed the percentage of U.S. mutual fund holdings to gold. It amounts to around 1%, and it's creeping up slowly. Uh, we, we've further seen this trend in physically backed gold ETFs, uh, which has been quite exponential so far this year, uh, and anecdotally strong uptake in demand for allocated gold bars in both London and Zurich. Uh, the path is clear from the investor base, although allocations do vary by region. Uh, in Asia, for example, it feels that the deployment is around 75 basis points to the portfolio. So. We do see upside to allocation. Uh, a recent study by Jenny Tevers, uh, UBS's precious metals analyst, suggests uh, an optimal portfolio allocation towards uh, 5%, uh, as depicted in the bottom right. And, and uh, you know, the, the analysis that we did looks at a long-only portfolio split between uh, stocks and bonds over a 30-year time frame. And you know, the conclusion here being that the true value of gold to conventional investors stems from its diversification properties. Uh, and that relates to the portfolio against other core holdings. And hence, we do see this upside to stick allocation. The part plan remains healthy, and I will return back to that shortly. And that brings us into the price discovery. And it's quite a hot topic, uh, market dislocation. You know, with gold being a tangible asset that requires delivery or settlement into various locations around the world, the, the breakdown in the supply chain in late March, early April 
uh, led to quite a few difficulties in moving metal from one place to another. As such, there proved to be quite a challenging backdrop in managing physical liquidity in the key centers that gold trades. Um, whilst physical demand into Asia has been very poor this year, uh, the key centers, London, uh, Zurich for OTC and uh, New York for, for the futures market, have had their unique challenges. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll, we'll focus on the EFP market, the exchange for physical, uh, being the basis between uh, the active Comex Gold futures for delivery into New York uh, depository and the local London gold uh, spot price. Uh, the basis, uh, historically shown uh, this year in the top right-hand corner uh, by the black line, uh, has traditionally been a cash and carry tool uh, for, for, for the banks. Uh, so a short position in the active futures against an equal and opposite long position in, in London gold has historically returned a positive yield. It typically trades between 3 and $10 per ounce. And as you can see, with a blowout of uh, what happened on the back of COVID, COVID it, it, it trended towards 80 to to $100 in early April. So the unwind of the FP curry trade was, was caused by a few factors. Initially, there was an e-jack liquidation in gold down to 14.50 in March. Dealers in, in, in the marketplace who had sold COMEX futures were buying back the EFP to hedge the basis. Uh, secondly, what, what broke the camel's back effectively was the fact that the Swiss refineries that seized production on the back of uh, social distancing measures in, in early April, and given the Switzerland fab fabricates uh, nearly 70% of, of, of the good delivery and fabricated cast bars that comes from, from mines around the world, it, it caused quite a few issues. And um, the breakdown of supply chains, as I mentioned, shipping gold, uh, we, we usually ship gold in, in commercial jets. Uh, there were no flights going into New York, so that caused a big problem. And obviously, the banks are looking at the bar limits, uh, getting compromised as the EFP trended to those high levels, and uh, you know, the, the whole market was effectively buying this EFP back. And we've seen, in the, uh, as per the bottom left, there's been a migration of liquidity from uh, futures to, to OTC. So that's what it's meant to price discovery. The, the, with the extreme volatility of the FP, traders have become more reluctant to manage the basis risk, and as such, OTC volumes have materially, on some weeks, overtaken listed. And we're fortunate that the LBMA have started to publish OTC uh, weekly uh, volume data uh, on a spot basis against the active COMEX futures. And on several weeks, it's overtaken. And, and to make it a bit more interesting, we indexed UBS's uh, internal OTC gold e-channel flows on the bottom right-hand side to 100 in December 2018. And you can see post-COVID in March this year by the black line uh, how much our own internal volumes as a proportion uh, outstripped the, the increase or, 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 or the trends in, in, in the futures market. So that's where the liquidity is. The next slide leads us quite nicely into the evolution of market participants and where people are actually expressing themselves in, in gold. There's, there's been a tectonic shift in, in demand trends this year. Thanks to the WGC, we, we, and excuse the pun, we, uh, the, the prevalence of that gold bar in that final line of the histogram that shows you how much uh, the market is effectively relying on, on ETF demand this year to prop up the price. Uh, uh, we've seen physical purchases into China and India dwindling as their economies generally struggle to recover. I mean, focusing on China, for example, the Shanghai Gold Exchange has trended to an extreme discount to London, currently around 40 to $50 per ounce. And we've, in fact, seen here at UBS a supply of bars coming into Zurich over the last few weeks. That was metal that was previously earmarked for China. It's simply not going there. So, as I mentioned, replacing this demand destruction and more, there's been a surge in allocation type demand. Record half one ETF accumulation is, is depicted by the WGC chart. Uh, and other OTC channels clearly describes this particular demand uh, trend. And I would say risk parity investors, pension funds, long-only asset managers, they remain very actively involved in accumulation, and, and we feel the pipeline will continue to remain healthy uh, in, into uh, the end of the year and into next year. And I would kid it to a bulk super tanker that, that the turning pivot is slow, but as they achieve approvals and mandates, the travel direction into gold remains very clear into 2021. Along with questions on dislocation, the other big discussion topic that I'm asked is, is, is how crowded is the gold trade. And I'd say that the nature of the participant has changed the marketplace beyond all recognition this year. Um, and the narrative that I'm referring to a new buyer in the form of uh, equity and bond allocators shows for further potential uh, additions. 
that said, I think it's important to finish this particular subject by acknowledging the growth in, in retail participation and the emergence of technology-enabled trading. Just, just in the bottom half of the screen, we, we can just look at some more esoteric indicators, uh, the prevalence of gold headlines on Bloomberg, for example. They have an index that shows the spike there in gold. If, so, if anything, that could be a proxy as to the peaked interest in, in the media. And that's in the financial press, of course, and, and certainly that there's more prevalence in, in the mainstream media and social media. Although the, the data isn't uh, available anymore post-August, I thought it was interesting to, to track that the well-documented uh, Robinhood investor. They've stopped sharing uh, the data now on the RobinTrack website, but it shows the participation in the GLD gold ETF on, on the final chart, and it perfectly matches the, the gold price. So I'd say you know, this technology-enabled trading is, is, is certainly making the market a lot more democratized. And whilst this nature of investor can be more fickle than the, the long-only investors, uh, it further brings uh, certainly a new dynamic into the gold market. Thank you very much.